consciousness is creating your reality. If you put a picture of fear into your reality, then your biology behavior will manifest things to be afraid of. Because this is a, a short statement, but to me, it's the most powerful one. Simple and short, and it goes like this. The function of the mind is to create coherence between your beliefs and your reality. If I have a negative belief, the function of my mind is to manifest behavior to experience those negative realities. If I have positive beliefs, then the function of my mind is to manifest a positive experience. But we get programmed with so many negative beliefs, and that takes away our power because we're not focusing on the beautiful things, we're focusing on the fear. What are you afraid of? Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I struggled to stay afloat. I quit my business partner, and the thing that kept me going was studying the stories of famous entrepreneurs and seeing how they struggled and seeing what they had to overcome and listen to their wisdom and motivation gave me the courage, the strength, the belief to go one more day and see my business through. And in all honesty, I still need the inspiration, wisdom, motivation today for my business too. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Bruce Lipton, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is change your beliefs. There are three ways to change belief, okay? Self-hypnosis, earphones on at night. Repetition, create a new habit. And third one, energy psychology, which allows you to rewrite an existing program in minutes. Uh, and we need to do this. Why? Because if you haven't noticed and you haven't looked out the window, the world's falling apart. <laughs> I go, and why is it falling apart? And the answer is because we're facing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life. The web of life is collapsing. I go, then why is the web of life collapsing? The answer is human behavior. I go, oh, you don't want the web to collapse? We have to change the behavior. And this is what the world is experiencing at this time. The chaos all over the world is bringing to light the fact that these behaviors we're fighting and violently with are behaviors that have taken us out of heaven and put our consciousness into a world that we're experiencing, which is falling apart. You want to make a world of heaven? Then you change the program and then you could have heaven. It's your belief system that, that creates this. You fell in love because you stopped playing your program and you created heaven. I say, well, guess what? Heaven was always there, except the damn program got in the way. So you want heaven on earth? Don't play the program, stay mindful, or B, rewrite the existing program and put heaven on earth programs in there, and then 95% of the day you'll be playing that. Rule number three is activate the power of manifestation. The body provides us with sensations, pain, love, joy, happiness, anger, <laughs> whatever. It comes from this mechanism. It's a mechanism. The, the eyes take in light, but they don't, they, they don't see light back here in the brain. They see energy vibrations. Sound comes in my ears. I don't hear the sound. I hear the vibrations. Taste, that's a vibration. It's a chemical vibration. And all of a sudden, oh my God, this is a transducer. It takes life experiences in a body that gives us vision and smell and taste and touch and pain and love and joy. And, and I say, and this is sent back to our source. So we came here to have life experiences. And I go, at that moment of awakening, I said, oh, crap. Here's the major difference between men and women. <laughs> men are not allowed to have these sensory experiences. And I'll give you a reason. But women are. So women are sensitive. The, and that's a way of life for them. They're sensitive. And then they go, but, but men are so insensitive. I go, that was a program. We were programmed to be insensitive for a very simple reason. You cannot be a soldier if you're sensitive. You can't kill somebody if you're sensitive. So men have been knowingly programmed to lose sensitivity so they can be used to do those jobs like killing somebody else. And I go, oh my God, then I missed the reason for being on this planet. I missed the feeling of what is love all about? You know, what are these senses of joy and happiness? I'm not allowed to experience them as a guy because uh, that interferes with a soldier job. <laughs> I go, I'm wasting my life. And that was a wake up call. I said, well, damn it, go out and taste it and touch it and feel it and smell it and do whatever you want. And if it's really good, do it again.
And if it didn't work out so good, then don't do that one again. You came here to have these experiences. Why would you want to waste your life having all the negative fear, anxiety, all those problems? It was a choice. It was consciousness. But we didn't know that because we were programmed to be victim. And a victim has no power. And as long as you believe you're a victim, then you manifest victim. Uh, uh, and this is why I'm so uh, honored to be with you, Jeff, because you're experiencing this. You know this stuff. You're trying to get this message out to the other people. Why? To wake us all up. Because we came here to manifest heaven on earth, like falling in love. And I go, then what about all this war and pestilence and plague and, and all these things? I go, oh, that's a manifestation. <laughs> and we're manifesting it. You can live in this world without even being involved with all those things. You just have to change who you are and what you are and what you want, conscious mind, versus programs, subconscious mind. And when you understand this, you become empowered. And I say, empowered to do what? I say, create heaven on earth. <laughs> and then people think, oh, you die and go to heaven. I go, boy, is that a big mistake? Because you're going to get to the pearly gates. St. Peter's going to be there. And he says, well... How was your experience in heaven? He said, what do you mean? I said, you were on earth, right? That's heaven. Why? That's where you came to create. What did you create? I go, oh, I don't want to wait to the end, man. <laughs> uh, my, my, my mother remarried when she was relatively older, and she married this guy who was, I said, curmudgeon-y guy. He was not really a happy guy or anything. He lived to be like 95, 96 or something. He had cancer. My mother took care of him at home. The last week of his life, he essentially wasn't there. He was just comatose, more or less, in the bed. And then two days before he died, he all of a sudden his eyes opened up. He was there. And he looked at my mother and he said, I didn't have any fun. And all of a sudden I just said, holy crap, he's going to die in two days. And he woke up today. <laughs> he didn't have any fun. I said, that's not me, babe. Because when I finish, it's going to be, that was great. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> Rule number four is reprogram your subconsciousness. How effective is your conscious mind at overriding the subconscious? I say it works 5% of the time with a miniature computer. And I go, wow, that's your problem. I go, the only way you can override the program is not play the program. And that's when we said, stay mindful. And then we then said, well, that's going to be difficult because we have to think. So there's only one way out. No, no, don't keep it a secret. Tell everybody. There's only one way out. Reprogram the subconscious mind. And I go, significance. If you would put wishes and desire programs into the subconscious mind, that means that that program would be operating 95% of the day. Meaning, whether your conscious mind is in control saying, these are my wishes and desires, or the conscious mind's thinking, then the subconscious mind comes in and says, these are my wishes and desires, then guess what? Then 100% of your life, you're living wishes and desires. And therefore, all of a sudden, then the, 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 the work has to come back to each of us as individuals. Each of us got programmed. Each of us is manifesting that program. We give up our power in many of the programs. The fine example is, you were sick as a kid, and just like your parents and any other family members, when you were sick, you went to the doctor. And I go, well, that's a habit. I said, what does it mean? It says, you learn this in the first seven years, the program. It says, when you're sick, you give up this power, and you go to that doctor, and you accept the doctor as the power of over you. Because when it came to health, it's like, no, no, you don't do it. The doctor does it. That's the program. I say, so what's the point? You have given up power over the control of your life and have given it to the truths, quote unquote, offered by the doctor. I go, significance. I go, the doctor misreads your diagnosis and then tells you, oh, I'm sorry, you only have three months left to live. And I go, significance. 95% of the day, the program says the doctor is the, you know, the correct one. The truth. What do I know? The doctor knows. What do I know? So 95% of the day, then your belief system is going to do what? Take the words of the doctor and manifest them as truth. I go, what's that mean? Well, you're going to die in about three months. I go, from what? I go, hey, that was a misdiagnosis. <laughs> you're still going to die because your belief system will manifest an illness. 
that will terminate. Cancer, for example, is not due to any genes. There's no gene that causes cancer. The genes are correlated with cancer. And I go, well, what causes cancer? I say disharmony and repressed anger is one of the big ones. Mm. I go, so then I say, the genes didn't cause it? I say, no. So I said, then what caused it? I say, my consciousness. I say, what? Repressed anger, <laughs> you know? And I go, so what? I say, well, change consciousness. And guess what? You can go into remission. The cancer will go away as soon as you change the consciousness. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, I thought I was a victim of the genes. I said, that's a program. And that is totally incorrect. Because as quantum physics says, consciousness is creating our life experiences. And as the new biology, which I'm familiar with, called epigenetics, is how consciousness controls the genetics. And all of a sudden I say, oh, well, then biology and quantum physics now share the same story. Yeah, you're creating this. And the idea is then if you look at the creation, you're not happy with it. Don't go out and blame the creation because you never saw that you were participating in a way invisible to you that led to this expression. If you want to change it, you have to change you and then the environment will change. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is overcome the fear of mortality. The fear, which is human specific, is the fear of mortality. There's no other organism that knows it's going to die. And I say that fear is what then we gave up our power to have somebody assuage that fear. It's like, oh, it's not so bad or whatever. You know, we, we bought what? Religion. Why did we buy religion? Well, I'm going to tell you about what happens after you die, the big mystery. And I say, oh. Then all of a sudden, guess what? They made the program for my life. I go, who the hell are you to make a program for my life? Well, I bought it because I was in fear. And fear means I have no power. And when I have no power, I'm going to seek someone who says they have the power. And then I'm going to accommodate what they do. And so people join in a religion because they have the fear of the afterlife. Well, I'm going to tell you the beautiful part about my research was I didn't believe in spirituality. Okay. I had no, to me, afterlife was, oh, I'm chemicals, and when I die, I go back into chemistry. You know, that's what it is. But when I understood this, I said, oh, my God, I'm an immortal entity. I'm a spiritual field, quantum mechanics, a field. And all of a sudden, I started to realize, oh, my goodness, I, 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 I have no fear. Why? I'm not going to die. I'm not even in here. So how the hell am I going to die? And once that fear was gone... My life was radically different. I tell you why. Because we all live with that biological imperative that says, I'm afraid to die. <laughs> and I said, but what if you're not afraid to die? What if you don't see death as an end? What if you see it as just a transition into another way? And all of a sudden I say, what the consequence of that is? No fear. I say, then what does that mean? I say, then I'm more powerful because it was the fear that took away my power. And if I don't have fear, then you can't scare me. And I don't, I'm not scared. And I don't care about your rules about afterlife because I have my own understanding now. You don't have to try and tell me about afterlife. I know what I am. I'm a spirit. I'm an energy field. Rule number six is boost your immune system. The immune system protects you from a threat on the inside. Yeah. But if the tiger's chasing you, who cares about the threat on the inside? I go, I got a bacterial infection and a saber-toothed tiger chasing me. I think, where, where should I put my energy? And I, the hell with the infection. A tiger catches you. That infection is not a problem anymore. So yeah. very important fact, profoundly, everyone listen. Stress hormones specifically shut down the immune system. Because the taking care of the inside is not as important as taking care of the whole thing running away. Uh, in fact, stress hormones are so good at this that when doctors want to transplant an organ from person A into person B, 
the recipient of that organ is given stress hormones before the operation because it reduces the function of the immune system, which would be rejecting the graft. And wow. so you don't want the immune system to reject a graft. So you give them stress hormones, which what? Shuts down the immune system. I go, well, guess what? In today's world, just watch the news for a moment. And all of a sudden your immune system is going. Mm. Yeah. So that's number two. So number one, stress hormones shut down growth because feeding the viscera for its functions, not worthy uh, of running away. I need to get the blood into the arms and legs. Uh, again, to conserve energy, because look, the immune system uses a lot of energy. If you've ever been sick, sometimes you don't have the energy to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, when it's operating, it could drain you of energy. Yeah, but if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, <laughs> the, the hell with the immune system. Uh, and, and so you shut that down. Mm -hmm. So those are two insults to the system. In other words, if I'm not under stress, I, I'm nourishing my body and I'm encouraging my immune system, I'm staying healthy. But the moment I'm under stress, both of those things shut down and I'm ready to, to fight or flight. Uh, and then I, I said, well, there's a third one. I call that adding insult to injury. And the answer about what that means is this. The brain has the forebrain where conscious thinking is, conscious thinking. And the hindbrain, which is uh, like habit and reflex behavior. Mm. Conscious thinking is slow. I mean, uh, imagine your car is going out of control and it's spinning. And I say, stay in the conscious mind. It's like, Oh, <laughs> I say, yeah, but the moment the car starts to go out of control, the stress hormones go in. Remember, I told you they squeeze the blood vessels in the gut. They mm. squeeze the blood vessels in the forebrain. I say, why? Because it pushes the blood to the hindbrain, which is a million times more powerful than the forebrain as a machine processor. And I go, so why is it relevant? I go, because the moment the car is going out of control, it's, oh, well, you're turning the wheel, hitting the pedals, you're doing everything beyond fast, so fast, okay? Yes. So when you're in a stressful situation, thinking is slow. And therefore, the system doesn't want you to be slow. It needs you to go, boom, react, reflect right away. So the blood vessels from the same chemistry, squeezing the blood vessels down the gut, squeeze the blood vessels here, push it to the hindbrain. We become less intelligent mm. when we're under stress because now we're reactive. And it gets to a point that sometimes you're so afraid that you take care of me. <laughs> and then we give up, we give up control to the guy with the bigger stick. Yeah. <laughs> you take care of me. Well, that means we're a victim. Yeah. Victim means we're powerless. I go, when stress hormones are in the system, the only power you have is to run. Mm -hmm. And I go, and the relevance about that is very, is very simple. And, and that is that it was only designed with saber toothed tigers in mind. I go, why is that relevant? They say, well, a saber-toothed tiger is chasing you. I go, yeah, and I'm running like crazy. I got blood in my arms and legs. I got all the energy. And I say, yeah, but if you escape that tiger in a few minutes of running, then there's no more threat. And then all of a sudden, the stress hormones are gone, and then you're back into growth and everything else. But today, mm -hmm. stress is 24-7, 365. A human body was never designed to be maintaining a stress situation because it suppresses the vitality of the system. And in today's world with the idea of COVID, everyone's afraid. <laughs> I go, and guess what? The one thing you wanted was your immune system to work. And the one thing that's not working because you're afraid is the immune system. I go, the more fear people have, the sicker they become. Yes. And this is a wake up call that says, man, we have to stop listening to that fear drum. They keep beating the drum. Every oh, Everybody's going to die. I go, no, it's not <laughs> going to die. You know, there are people who are indeed vulnerable because they're already stressed immune system. People that live in stress are already uh, open to a problem. Uh, older people whose immune system is, uh, are not working up to the fullest capability, they're under threat because their immune system is already compromised. And then there's the people with what are called comorbidities. I go, what are they? I say, these are stressors on the system that are chronic. Overweight is one of the biggest ones. Uh, in the serious cases of COVID, 78% of those serious patients were overweight. Why? 
overweight is a challenge to the system and you're already challenging your immune system before the damn virus showed up. So that's a big problem. Uh, diabetes type two, meaning that's a stress world. Diabetes is a stressor that's in the system. The more stressors that you have going, the less effective your immune system is. So it turns out, here's a number, unfortunately, Americans, uh, 60% of Americans have at least one comorbidity. They're slightly compromised, okay? Uh -huh. But 40%, and this is where the issue comes from, have two or more simultaneous mm -hmm. comorbidities. These are people that are ripe for infection. Why? Mm -hmm. Their immune systems are already compromised before the damn virus showed up. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well then, I'm a, am I afraid of COVID? I said, well, if you're a healthy person, no. <laughs> If you're, you know, if you're a compromised person, then you should be taking care of yourself. Mm. I don't have to take care of myself. You mm. have to take care of yourself because you're the one that's open. And yet we want everybody to put on the mask and everybody to get the vaccines. I go, that the, that stuff, I was going to say a bad word, that stuff <laughs> is not valid. I go, what do you mean it's not valid? I say, uh, the, the country of Gibraltar, 100% of that population has been vaccinated. And guess what? Delta went through there like a plague, man. And I say, yeah, but they were all vaccinated. I go, yeah, because the vaccine doesn't work. I go, well, yeah, but now Omicron. I go, no, the vaccine doesn't work. And they say, well, get your booster shot. I say, get the booster shot. It didn't even work the damn first time. Why should it take the second time? It does not work. <laughs> and so the real issue is this. We have to take care of our health uh, and not wait for other people to protect me from them. Mm. Uh, if I'm a vulnerable person, it's my responsibility to take care of my health. Rule number seven is create with your mind. Mind controls not just what genes are being activated, but mind can alter the blueprint. I can make 3,000 different proteins from the same blueprint just based on how I see the world. So all of a sudden it says, wow, we are very powerful. We're the architects and we can create health. But we can also create disease because we're the creator of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now comes the, the, the big part, and that is this. To me, the most valid science on this planet is quantum physics. Quantum physics, uh, I say that because uh, back in 1927 when it was theoretical, they came up with a whole bunch of things, you know, Albert Einstein, Max Planck, Heisenberg. They came up with a theory of how everything worked. Well, it's nearly 100 years, and guess what? Almost all of their theories are totally accurate. So we have a deep, deep understanding of quantum physics. Consciousness is creating our life experience. Principle number one. It was back in 1927. Max Planck, founder, one of the founders, said, the mind is the matrix of all matter. That's where the movie The Matrix comes from. Rule number eight is acknowledge what you want. Do you see value in going backwards? In other words, in psychotherapy or in going back to the past? No. And so you say, but why wouldn't I, why didn't I see value? And then I said, because when you go back and replay that problem, you've exercised that problem again. You have pushed the buttons that created the problem in the first place. That's why they have so many boxes of tissues in the, in the psych office, because you're going to cry your eyes out. Why? Because you're going to be replaying the trauma of what caused the problem. And this is the cool part. It no longer exists. It's not there anymore, except for you carrying it with you. Mm. And there's a point where I say, well, then why should I go back and repeat this? Because it's just going to cause a replay of the same program, which reinforces that program. I go, I don't care about the past. I care about, here I am today, I want to go this way, what do I want today? I don't care about what happened back there. Not that I should forget about it, because I don't want to replay it again. But it doesn't control me anymore, because I say, replaying that is just, the you know, putting a, in the old days they had records you guys don't know about, but they had <laughs> record. Uh, and if you keep playing the record, the needle gets deeper in the, in the groove. <laughs> I go, we don't want to play it again. So it's irrelevant to go back. Uh, I like it. There's a, a story of uh, two Buddhist monks. Uh, uh, monks are not, uh, the, the male monks are not allowed to touch women. 
And these two monks are walking along the path and they come to a river and there's a woman all dressed up in her wedding finery and she's crying and crying. Uh, and it's what's wrong. She says, well, I can't get across the water and, you know, I'll ruin my clothes. And so one monk just picks her up, walks across, drops her on the other side. And then the two monks walk down the street about half hour, 45 minutes later, the one that didn't pick her up turns to him and said, you picked up a woman back there. <laughs> and then the other monk says, I put her down 45 minutes ago. You're still carrying her. <laughs> uh, and if you get the story, the story is this. It was over. The history is over. Do I want to repeat it? No. So there's a way of seeing what it was, but I don't have to repeat it because I have to say, what is it I want? Not what is it I don't want? A lot of people say, I don't want this. I go, yeah, but what is it you want? People have more problems answering what it is they want than saying what they don't want. Mm. And, uh, and the important part about this is you can only move into the future that you want by acknowledging what you want, not saying, I don't want that anymore. I said, well, that didn't, that didn't give you your future. Uh, and, and so, yes, there are ways to reprogram the subconscious. Uh, and when you do, your life will change in permanently. Rule number nine is study physics. As you understand the terms quantum physics and quantum mechanics or Newtonian physics and Newtonian mechanics, what you see is that physics and mechanics are synonyms. So physics really means the mechanisms by which the universe operates. And the new physics, quantum physics, was something that I really wasn't into, nor were any of my colleagues in the medical school. We were all trained in Newtonian physics. And the difference between the two is very profound. Newtonian physics says, the world that we live in, the universe we live in, is a, is a machine made out of mechanical parts. If you want to understand how it works, take it apart, study the pieces, change the pieces, change the operation. That's the basis of medicine. We look at a human body, it's a machine made out of physical parts. When it's not working right, change the parts by buying chemicals and drugs. Uh, and that's the way that conventional medicine operates. When I started to read the quantum physics, I realized, oh my goodness, the, the whole foundation of the universe is not based on a mechanical, physical universe, it's based on the invisible energy called the field. So uh, let's say if I hold a magnet right here in front of you, and you can see the magnet, but what you can't see is the invisible magnetic field. And, and so what it says is, well, we are physical things in our world like physical bodies. We're immersed in fields, electromagnetic uh, fields, magnetic fields itself, uh, all kinds of fields like telephone, uh, cell phone fields, uh, television fields, radio fields, whole ranges. What is the difference between the Newtonian physics and the qu and quantum physics is this. Newtonian physics focus on the particles. Quantum physics says, you want to understand why the particles take this shape? Then you have to understand the field. It's the field that controls biology. It's the invisible forces. There's a great quote by Albert Einstein, and it's, it's simple. It goes, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. In other words, in the world of invisible things, fields, and particles matter, it's the field that gives shape to the matter. And this is the basis of quantum physics. This becomes relevant. It says, okay, here's the physical particles of my body. Why are they in a healthy state or why could they be in a sick state? That's the physical expression. And the answer is, well, to understand that, don't look at the body. You have to understand the invisible forces in the field. Uh, it, 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 and it's fun because if you think about it, when, 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 of course, when, when you were young, at some point you must have had like iron filings and sprinkled it around a magnet, and all of a sudden you saw the iron filings form that pattern of the magnetic field. Well, quantum physics would look at this pattern and try to explain how come all the iron filings fell in this pattern without recognizing that the field exists. In other words, can you explain why the iron filings have this shape if you don't recognize the magnetic field? And the answer is absolutely not. What's the nature of it? The body and its cells are like iron filings. Medicine is trying to understand the nature of the body by looking at the iron filings. And quantum physics says, if you don't understand that invisible field, you can't ever understand what's happening in the body. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is get in the flow. When you think about someone who's an artist and they're creating a musician, a chef, um, a chef, a chef or, or in love, like you're in the flow, right? So you're yeah, just because like, you're 
You're, you're not thinking. Yeah, you're not thinking, you're doing. And it doesn't mean there's not participation. It just means that you're not thinking of the future. You're kind of just well, yeah, it's time and space sort of change. Like you lose track of time, yes. like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not thinking means not diverting to the subconscious, meaning you stay in conscious creativity. Yeah. Conscious creativity is wishes and desires. So a chef uh, is so involved with the cooking and paying attention to all the details, they're not thinking. And I say, well, what does that mean? They're not coming from program. They're coming mm-hmm. from creativity, okay? The artist, the chef, uh, the race car driver. Okay? Yeah. We're not thinking, man. Uh, you know, we're in it. <clears throat> we're going. I had a monk tell me I should write a book called The Speed of Consciousness. Well, that, that's it. Uh, and the subconscious is much faster than the conscious. And that's why in times of emergency, the conscious is too slow to help us, and that's why we jump to it. But then the problem is, whatever behavior you're going to express while you're in that subconscious was a program that you had, a positive or a negative. Well, up to 60% of the programs that you downloaded are not positive. They're disempowering so, programs. The world is in a state of evolution. And what I mean by evolution is not a physical evolution. Humans are not going to change into something different. The evolution that we're really uh, experiencing now is an evolution in consciousness. A consciousness that has in the past separated us as individuals. A consciousness that has been programmed with a belief that life is a struggle and that we're out here uh, to survive. We have to be in competition with each other and undercut and undermine. And we were acting as individuals looking for our own individual power. But in today's world, there's a new understanding that the evolution is an evolution of consciousness, an evolution of an expansion of, we are more than just these physical entities, that there is an energy involved. In Newtonian physics, the conventional ones that most people have learned, atoms are physical particles, like little granules. But in 1925, physicists came to another understanding because they said, so what are those particles made out of you called atoms? and they went inside. And they found there were smaller so-called particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons, but that still wasn't the quest because what are they made out of? And that's when the world changed. Because when quantum physicists started to say, what is an electron or a proton or a neutron made out of? It's made out of energy, not physical, no substance. An atom is like a nano tornado, a spinning force field. There's an illusion that we are physical entities. You're an energy field. And I go, so what the heck difference does that make? And I go, well, here's the interesting part. Particles, I can separate. Here's a particle, here's a particle. Let's talk about one particle. Energy just mixes all together. I'm sitting in a field of energy right now. So if I'm made out of energy, which I am, does it mean that the edge of my energy stops right here? And the answer is no. In quantum mechanics, I'm an energy field. Wherever I go, I'm like a broadcast, broadcasting an energy. Wherever you are right now, you're broadcasting energy. And so in a Newtonian world we grew up with, this is separate from this and that's separate from this. And I go, in a quantum mechanical world, nothing is separate. Everything is an energy field with no borders to it. So what I do in my world is not just what I do in my world. What I do in my world is broadcast to everything else. And if it resonates or is in harmony with you, my energy can affect your energy, or my energy can actually cancel your energy. Everything is interconnected. The chair I'm sitting on is energy. The air I'm in breathing with is energy. I'm energy, you're energy. We're all connected in this energy. But the fact is, energies are communications. And we vibrate and broadcast just like a radio. We're broadcasting who we are out into the field and we alter what's going on. It is beyond language. It's a communication that has nothing to do with words. It's an energy that's available if you just want to feel it. And I think that's the big issue, feelings. Because feelings are telling you, you feel good? Yes, I'm having more energy. You feel bad? You feel weak? I'm having less energy. And I say, why is it relevant? It's more powerful than words. Energy can tell me, am I with people that are supporting me because I feel good around them? Or do I have a little quasi feeling of this it doesn't feel right to me? So we have a new world that we're coming into and it's based on the energy. And if you can read energy, you are being guided. 
If you can't read energy, you don't know what's going to happen next. If you follow the words, that's where we have been sold a bill of goods, where people say, yeah, these are good words, what do you think? And then you know, I'll buy that because the words. And I say, yeah, but if you ever stop long enough to say, how do you feel about it? Not how, what you hear about it. It empowers you beyond anything in the world. So the wake up call now is, yeah, listen to people, fine, but feel, feel it, people. Feel where you are. Feel, is this what I want to do? Do I want to do this or I want to do that? I say, you can ask your head and rationalize anything. But I say, don't ask that question in your head. Ask the question of your heart. Your heart is the monitor of the vibration. Your heart will give you an answer more accurate about anything in your world than your rational thinking will. You're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Mm -hmm. I say, you, you need energy to, to survive. You have to run. Mm -hmm. I say, where's the energy going to go? I say, well, energy's in the blood. That's what carries the energy. I say, when the stress hormones come in because the tiger is chasing you, it does several things. <laughs> it shuts off the blood flow to the, the gut, the viscera, the mm -hmm. all the organs, pancreas, stomach, intestines. I go, it shuts off the blood supply. I say, why? I don't need to fix and maintain the body if the tiger is going to catch me. <laughs> then I don't. That's a waste of my energy. I want all the energy. Go to my arms and legs to escape. So I say, stress hormones shut off the, the mechanism of the viscera, the growth and maintenance of the body while you're being chased. I say, what else? And here comes the one that you were bringing up. When, when we're really sick, you don't have a lot of energy to even get out of bed mm -hmm. because the immune system uses a lot of energy to keep you healthy. I go, so I'm being chased by a tiger, and I have a bacterial infection, so I'm putting energy in to run away, I'm putting energy into the infection. I go, why do you worry about the infection? Because if the tiger catches you, the infection is not a problem anymore. <laughs> You're done, okay? So the, this is the point you brought up, and this is the most important point for the audience to understand. Stress hormones shut off the immune system so that the energy can be used to run away from the tiger before being used to fight the bacteria. Uh, and, and this is the most important understanding because stress is the cause of over 90% of illness on this planet. Mm. Everyone thinks genes are causing the illness. I go, less than 1% of illness is connected to genes. 90% of illness is stress because when you put the stress hormones in, what do they do? They shut off the maintenance of the body. They shut off the immune system, and they even shut off the intelligence. They go, what do you mean they shut off the intelligence? I say, if the conscious brain, the one up in the front that's connected to you, your person, is a slow processor, like a slow computer. The subconscious is like a super fast computer. If you're being chased by a tiger, it's not the time to think of, oh, oh, I'm be oh, oh. I go, no, no, run! <laughs> And so the stress hormones shut down the blood vessels in the forebrain, where the consciousness is, pushes the blood with the energy to the hindbrain, where reflexes and reaction, no thinking, because thinking is slow. So I say, so then stress hormones do three things. Number one, they shut off the growth and maintenance of the body. Number two, they shut down the immune system, which protects you from internal problem. And number three, they make you less intelligent. And I go... <laughs> Yes. Look at the look at the world today. The stress levels are overriding. As I said, 90% of illness is straight stress, not mm -hmm. genetics. It's lifestyle. It's the fear. It's not living in harmony. They don't have enough good music <laughs> to yeah. bring harmony into their world. They're, they're on edge. <laughs> I go, well, that automatically compromises your health. Less than one, listen, less than 1% of disease is connected to genes. I go, where the hell's all the disease coming from? 90% mm. plus of disease is stress. Mm. And, and, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, so I said, well, you can relieve all the, take all the cancer cells out. I said, did you get rid of the stress? No. Oh, well then guess what? It's coming back <laughs> because that, the, the cells didn't cause the problem. They are a symptom of a problem. And yeah. all diseases, like cardiovascular disease, 90%. That's nothing to do with genes. 
you're not living in harmony. You're living in fear. A lot of it has that fear is the greatest cause of stress because fear means I'm powerless. That's what fear means. Oh my God, something's coming. I, I'm a victim. I am powerless. Somebody help me. And then the pharmaceutical company comes in and goes, we're here to help you. I go, another line of BS. Mm. I believe says, <laughs> pharmaceutical company isn't here to help you. It's a company. It's a corporation. I say, give me the rule, number one rule in law. When you make a corporation, what is the number one rule in the corporation's leadership? And the answer is, your job is to make a profit for the shareholder. That's number one. If a corporation is not making a profit for the shareholder, then it falls apart. It doesn't work anymore. So I say, well, how do you make a profit for the shareholder? I say, you got to make a lot of money. <laughs> I go, well, making a lot of money, does that mean you're going to help a lot of people? I go, ah, we'll tell them we'll help them. We'll sell them the drugs and they'll buy the drugs. And then we're going to make a lot of money. I say, do the drugs really work? I go, how many people are out there because the doctor said your blood pressure is high or your cholesterol level is high and we're going to have to give you statins, statin drugs. I go, how long do I, do I have to take a prescription of statin drugs? Mm -hmm. And then the doctor goes, how long do you want to live? <laughs> oh, you want to live? Then take statin drugs your whole life. I go, I got to take them my whole life. I say, are they going to help me? And now comes the truth. Statin drugs only help three out of 100 people. 97 people out of 100 have no positive effect from statin drugs. In fact, over 20 of those people will have side effects that are disastrous. So I said, wait, I took the statin drugs to help me with my cholesterol level. Three people are going to be helped. 20 people are going to get sicker. I go, well, maybe we shouldn't sell the statin drugs. They go, are you kidding me, man? That's a prescription for life. That means we have a customer for life. And I go, nobody paid attention to the side effects being more dangerous than the, the healing effect. And I go, people don't care because they're told whatever the advertisement told them. Hmm. Drug companies, they don't give a damn. Why? Because the 97 people that have no positive effect from statins are going to pay them every day of their life to take a statin drug. I say, is it going to help them? I go, nope. But they're going to pay for it every day. And the drug company's like, Yay! I could sell lots of sudden drugs. And, and you know what they did to sell more drugs? Because there was a cholesterol level. And it said, if you're above this cholesterol level, you need a statin drug. I go, then what did they do? They kept changing the cholesterol level over time. It was, no, no, you have to have less cholesterol. Oh, all of a sudden it said, people that you know had a certain level of cholesterol below the required part, no, I don't have to take statin drugs. And then I say, no, no, you need a cholesterol down here. Oh, now that many more people are going to take statin mm -hmm. drugs. Every time they lowered the amount of cholesterol to another level, there's a whole new, whole new cohort of people that are going to buy the statin drug. Because, oh, it used to be, oh, that cholesterol level was okay. Now it's not okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you got to take the drug because they kept lowering the level. And every time they lower the level, there's a million new customers for statin mm -hmm. drugs. Did it help? Absolutely not. The side effects were far greater, what, five, seven times greater side effects than healing. Just to begin with a very interesting concept that um, Judeo-Christianity has provided the large population of the world with a belief that Genesis occurred and God created the planet and the water and then the animals and the plants and after all this creation then God said let's add some humans to the mix so we didn't come from that creation we were added to the earth science comes in and also separates us from the planet because conventional science based on what is called Newtonian physics we are physical particles separate from each other no, we're all separate pieces and we lost the understanding that the word Gaia is a living organism. The earth is a cell. We are connected to everything. We've lost that vision. We feel that we are a piece in a, in a bunch of pieces. And as I said, are we going to be safe or are we going to be afraid in this? And I said, then we want to protect ourselves. And if you understand the breathing of most people, it's very shallow. 
It's right up here. Why? I don't want to take too much of the outside in. I'm protecting myself, but as Sadhvi just said, we, we still need oxygen. So we breathe in a little bit of oxygen, but we want to be separate. And the simple reality is those beliefs are totally false. We were created with everything. We are created from everything. There is no separation between us and the world in which we live. And so when we are breathing very shallow, we are actually, remember I said, protection, close yourself down. Shallow breathing, closing yourself down. When you start to learn to take in the breath of life, you are opening yourself to the entire world around us. And that opening of the world makes us part of this world, not a separate piece from one another. So breathing becomes a very important part of, am I hiding from the world by just breathing a little tiny bit? Or can I take in this breath and become part of this oneness that we are? Your separation is where all the problems of life come from. Your breathing can open you up to this entire world, to take it in. You are this world. You are every bit of this. You're a reflection of everything out there. You came from that. So basically, can we stop the protection that we think is helping us, but it's the protection that is killing us? And breathing, can I take this in? <gasps> can I take the world in? Yes. And I can thrive. And so when we start to let go of that protection, the breathing will start to go from shallow chest to abdominal because I'm taking in the world with every breath. I'm taking in the energy of the world with every breath. And that is what makes us whole. You have shallow breathing, you have fear. All of a sudden, you cannot be whole anymore. And so we come here to learn to take power back. And, and oh my God, closing word, yoga. <laughs> There's Bruce Lipton has two, two lives. Bruce Lipton, the guy who lives in the house and goes to the store and all that stuff. Okay. And Bruce Lipton, a scientist. I go, what's the difference? I say, Bruce Lipton, a scientist knows that from science, we are facing our own extinction because of our own human behavior. Bruce Lipton, as a scientist, also knows this. If you want to create a world that we can live in and sustain ourselves and be healthy, we have to change our behavior because our behavior is causing the problem. Mm -hmm. So I also know what does this mean? It says the structure has to break to build a better structure, a new civilization, because the foundation of this civilization is creating all the problems. It's the culture and the way we live with fear and hate and violence and all that. And I go, a garden, which we came from, a garden is the height of cooperation. Hmm. And we, we live in the height of, of war and violence and all this stuff. We, we live in competition. And, and the idea is this. Then the belief system of this civilization, the fear, the competition, the war, all that stuff, that's part of our creation because we're creating this hmm. physics. I say you want to change the world, you've got to change the creation. And we have to break this structure because the structure is perpetuating the problem. Yes, and it has to go in a chaos phase, it has to break down, yeah. That's right, Absolutely. so science Bruce goes, yep, it has to break down because that's how we're going to build a new one. Mm -hmm. And then Bruce, the guy who lives here, goes, what a mess, this is a, this is a crazy mess, this is scary, and blah, 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 blah. I'm living in crazy mess. But then Bruce Lipton Science comes in and says, you have to do this because the way you have been living is causing the problem, you have to change. Uh, and that's easy to say, but if you're out there in the world as a working person and everything and you have to experience, it's like it's falling apart. Ah! I go, that scares people. Scares people, stress hormones. Stress hormones, stop thinking and listen to whatever they said on the TV or the, or the web. Don't think. Shut down your, your health. Why? Because I'm running from that tiger because that, I am scared. Uh, and the point is, then the health issues got worse. <laughs> Just watching the news, you walk away with the stress hormones coming in. They're like, oh, and I go, you just all of a sudden made your system worse because the stress hormones are going to compromise you.
the most important thing about uh, transcending a program, as I mentioned before, is identifying what the program is. And that's why I wanted to give people an insight to their own programming by just reviewing their life and recognizing things you like come in because you have a program. Things you desire that don't come in is because you have a program that doesn't support that. And I said, well, how do you change these programs? Uh, and I said, there's three fundamental ways to change a program. And it's very critical because the subconscious mind is a habit mind. The conscious mind is a creative mind. And I go, what's the difference? I say, habit, by definition, doesn't want to change. I mean, if a habit changes, then it's not a habit anymore. So I say, first issue is this. The programs that we were downloaded with are habits. They were put into our mind before age seven. And then we just play them like a push the button, play the program, push the button, play the program. Now, not all habits are bad. As a matter of fact, uh, you wouldn't like it without a subconscious. I'll give you an example. When did you learn how to walk? You learned how to walk before you were two. You could be 102. You're still walking. I go, why? That habit is there and it doesn't change. And so the first thing we have to recognize, habits are not like open. Hey, just change me. You actually have to like push a record button to get into that habit. I go, well, how do you get a habit? I said, well, how did we get a habit in our life? I said, for the first seven years, we were in a state of consciousness called theta, which is hypnosis, and we downloaded it. Uh, and the relevance about that is uh, theta is a lower vibration than conscious, which is alpha and focus consciousness, beta. And I go, so why is it relevant? Because when we are working, like right now, we're in beta, high focus, consciousness, schoolroom kind of working like that. But when we go home and relax, the vibration slows down. It's called alpha. So we're in a calmer consciousness. But what people have to recognize is this. The moment you close your eyes, like I'm just going to sleep, consciousness switch went off. I'm not in, in alpha. I just dropped into theta. I go, well, consciousness is closed. But theta is hypnosis. So if you put earphones on, and you go to bed, uh, and you put the earphones on, and there's a program playing through those earphones of things that you want to be true in your life. Uh, you might hear some of the program while you're still awake, but the moment consciousness disconnects, you're in a zone of theta before you go to the lowest vibration, delta, which is absolute sleep. So every night, there's a window of opportunity. Put earphones on. As soon as your conscious mind goes to sleep, the subconscious mind is going to take whatever's coming in those earphones and begin to download them because that is hypnosis. So that's self-hypnosis. But that by age seven changes because by age seven, now we spend more time in consciousness than in theta. Uh, and I go, but we still learn things. You learn how to drive a car. You learn how to practice uh, uh, with an instrument. You learn all these things. I say, why is it relevant? And the answer is simply this. How did you create a habit? Practice. You practice it. So the second way of changing a program is practice a new life if you don't like the one you have. Uh, yeah, I like it, new agey people. Fake it till you make it. And I go, well, yeah, what does that mean? I said, well, I'm a miserable person. I want to be happy. So I said, but you're not happy. I said, yeah, but fake it. What does that mean? I say, all day long, anytime you can just consciously pass by, you say, oh, I am happy. I am happy. You could be miserable. I don't really care. The idea is I am happy. I am happy. Repetition practice is how you make habits. And so if you keep saying all day long, I'm happy, I'm happy, and you say it for a period of time because it's habit practice, there's a day you wake up and you, you already started happy because the program is already in there. You don't even have to do it anymore. When a raindrop hits a pond, the ripples that come off of the raindrop are the shape of water, but the water was shaped by the energy from the rock. So the energy is now visualized, not the, not the ripple itself, it's the shape of the ripple. So we have all these waves. And I go, so what? And I say, well, when you look at a pond and it's raining out, the first thing you notice is that all the ripples are converging with each other and they're modifying each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically everything is connected and everything is energy. But the final shape is really dependent on the, the waves and their patterns when they come together. Some energy comes together and it and enhances power. That's called constructive interference. Uh, and and in, human, in human terms, that is good vibes. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly because you're an energy pattern and if you're in an energy field that is in harmony with you, two energies in harmony come together and they, ha they add up. So that we get more power 
Okay, so there are fields that are really good and you can feel them, good vibes. And as I said, How, what's good vibes? I feel more power being around you. Not that I'm touching you or anything at that level because you're radiating, radiating energy, I'm radiating energy, but if we're radiating harmonic energy. Yeah, we're in musical terms, synchrony. Absolute. Or harmony. Harmony. Right. Versus and, dissonance. And that's or, enhancing of power. Yeah. yeah. But then there's another form of energy. And this other form of energy is, uh, let's say this wave is going up and this wave is going down. When this one's going down, this one's going up. So they're not in harmony. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're interfering. And it's called destructive interference, which is the opposite of when we just said two harmonies come together. Yeah. They're interfering, but it's called constructive because there's more power. But two energies can come together in a destructive form and cancel out everything. Uh, and like um, uh, in technology, they have earphones that are called noise canceling. Yeah. You got all this noise. You put the earphones on, the noise disappears. I said, what, what, where'd the noise go? And the interesting yeah. part was the earphones have a microphone. They're recording the sound of the environment, the vibration. And then through the electronics, it plays the sound back, but just out of phase. So they're oh, not yeah. both in harmony now. One is going up and the other is going down. They're just out of phase. But that, when you add up two out of phase waves, that's cancellation. That's so, so brilliant. To make uh, you know, uh, uh, those kind of earphones, for example, noise canceling, is it's not you subtracted something from a noise. You added a noise to a noise. You added a mm -hmm. vibration to a vibration. So now I say, oh, well, now there's two, there's a range. Energies can come together and enhance and multiply and be more powerful. Or energies that are not in harmony can come together and cancel each other out. Mm. Okay? Uh, constructive interference, destructive interference, but in human terms is... Constructive interference, good vibes, more power. Mm. And destructive interference, bad vibes. I want peace on the earth and all the rest are fighting all over the place. That means nothing. But if I get enough people to say we want peace on earth and we get to that number, and as Lynn said, it didn't start with a massive number. It started with a small number, but that number grew. Why? Buckminster Fuller saying it says build a better world people will come from that world to visit your world and what Lynn is showing we can build a better world and why is it increasing in number of people because people are saying I want what Lynn's has it always reminds me of the movie with Harry <laughs> Sally. I'll have what she's <laughs> having Sally fakes the <laughs> orgasm in the restaurant and another woman at a table watching her goes I want what she has well <laughs> this is what Lynn and Brian offer they have something to say. They have something. I want what she has. Why? Because it's empowering. Why? It changes your consciousness. Your consciousness is creating. If the creation doesn't look good, you don't change the world. You change the consciousness. The world then changes because of your creativity. And that's why um, Lynn's work uh, to me is so important to get people to wake up and say, uh, miracles happen when you get enough tuning forks together. And how many? Well, apparently, eight tuning forks is good to change it. <laughs> I mean, the first step, the first one was so <laughs> small and irrelevant in one sense, but so powerful was I'm working on this going, oh, my God, I, I've been programmed. And if I, if I follow the program, it's a good program, great. But if it's a bad program, I'm going downhill. Uh, and I remember I was in my office at the university and one of my faculty colleagues came in that day and said, okay, Bruce, what, what are you bringing to the faculty party on Saturday night? And I, I want to tell you, faculty party, might as well just kill yourself. You go there and everybody's sitting around with a drink, not talking to each other because they don't really like Gotta each other. Work in this. Okay. And I thought about that and I thought, I work all damn week. Why should I go to a stupid faculty party and waste the entire time where I had freedom to create something I would love to do? Mm. So, I'm, you know, it just came right out of my mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was this weekend. I have other plans. I can't, oh, I can't, I can't go this weekend. I didn't have <laughs> plans, but I just said that. And he looked at me like, you're not going to the faculty party? I go, no. And he walked out. And the moment he walked out, I went, oh, crap. I just got Saturday night for me. I can do what I want on Saturday night. And I started to say, what's next? And it what lined up. Next? 
what can I get rid of that I've been programmed that this is what we do socially, even though it takes away character, quality, joy out of life. And I started to eliminate them and say, wait, I'm creating this. I don't want to give up my creation because socially this is what we should do. I said, I got my life, man. I want to live it. And I have been living a heaven on earth life ever since those days. Why? Well, with the help of my partner, Margaret, who I met at 50, so 40 is a kid's age, at 50, uh, uh, and she, she was quite aware of all the stuff that I talked about, we changed, we rewrote our programs. Beautiful. And wow. we've been together, what, 26 years now? Oh, my God. A honeymoon uh-huh. every day. I wake up, hey, I'm still alive. I've got a great partner. We have a great life. I work uh, every day. I wake up. It's like, wow, I'm still here. I'm enjoying every day that I can get. It's called the honeymoon effect forever. Wow. So how do you do that? I say, get rid of the programs that took the joy away and replace them with programs that give you joy. What we now know is the conscious mind, if you stay in the conscious mind, you have power. But if the conscious mind is thinking... It is not using its power to interfere with the, or to enact with the outer world. Thinking is using the power to go to the inner world. So a thought is not outside, a thought is inside. Yeah, but the conscious is reading a thought. So I say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, the conscious is helping me create this world. Oh, wait, wait, the moment I'm thinking, I have to take that consciousness redirected, not look out, but redirected because thinking is inside. So I said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, the moment you are thinking, you are not creating your world at this moment. I said, what, what does that mean? I say, if you're driving the car and all of a sudden you start thinking, what it means is you're not looking out the window anymore. You are now looking inside because answers for thoughts are on the inside. And then you go, oh my God, you stop looking out the window, the car's going to crash. And I go, cool part or not. Yeah. <laughs> the subconscious is autopilot. So the moment consciousness is not paying attention, the subconscious takes the wheel. But now comes the problem. The subconscious is not you, it's the program. So if I got bad driving instructions, then when the subconscious takes the wheel as autopilot, it's going to take me down the road to ruin. It's Mm -hmm. not going to take me to where conscious says, I want to have this wonderful success. But my program is you're not worthy, you're not smart enough, you're not deserving. So when that program grabs the wheel, it's not going to take me to success. It's going to take me to where the program goes. So if I disempower you in your programming and 95% of your life comes from that, the rest of your life is struggle. And it's not because you couldn't create it. It's just you didn't realize that this subconscious guy is working 95% of the time and you don't see it. And Mm -hmm. this is where, how come life seems to be a struggle from the outside coming in when it's like, oh my God, you didn't get it. You're creating both success and you're creating failure. Mm -hmm. It's not coming from outside. Please listen to this. A negative thought is equally powerful in controlling the biology. So as much as a positive thought can heal you, a negative thought can kill you. It can make any disease. You can have a negative thought about cancer and manifest cancer. You have no no genes that are even cancer-related genes. And it's like, where the hell did it come from? You are creating your biology as a complement to what you see. Yeah. So if you see a positive world, then you're getting positive vibes coming in, and it feels really great. And if you live in a negative world or one you believe to be negative – then the cells are inside cowering, going, oh, my God, it's not safe out there. Uh, and, uh, and so my cells are just adjusting to my perception. So changing your perception is like, well, where's that? And I go, that's your mind. Humans have morality. We're supposed to anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, don't kill things. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're supposed to have morality. Yeah. But corporations have no morality. Mm-hmm. They just have a mission. How much money can I make? That is the mission by law of what a corporation is. So I say, then that's why they can do anything. Let's destroy the environment if we can make enough money. And all of a sudden you start to see the leadership of this world is not really caring about what the individuals want. Mm -hmm. They want to appease the money-making part. Mm -hmm. And then the laws come down, and uh, and if if it conflicts with a corporate law, 
then screw the people. Let's give the corporation their due. And that's mm -hmm. once we gave up uh, and we said humans are like, uh, corporations are like humans and have the power of a human. I go, no, they don't. They have no morality. They're nothing like a human at mm -hmm. all. Uh, and, uh, and we gave them all the power. And this is a wake up call for all of us. It said, who's caring for you? You know, mm -hmm. I love it. They always talk about the friendly banker. <laughs> When's the banker friendly? The banker is friendly when you have money. Yeah. If yeah. you don't have money, banker's not so friendly anymore. It doesn't care about you at all. Absolutely. You know, and I go, same thing, pharmaceutical company. You got money? We're working with you. Yeah, yeah I don't care about you if you have no money. Uh, and we lost. And so the evolution we're facing right now says we have been driven to this by a minds that have no uh, care for an environment. Mm. Hey, take what you want, do what you want, throw crap into the water. You know, all this kind of stuff. Dig out the natural resources. Every, it's like, what's our future if you do this? The answer is, it's already happening. Extinction. Mm -hmm. We're not in harmony with each other, obviously. And we're not in harmony with nature. And I say, well, that you got two choices here. Follow the money or follow the harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, unfortunately, this is a tug of war. And corporates are winning because fear. Mm. Because once you're afraid, you give up power. Fear is a definition. I'm not, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I go, well, then who's going to help you? Who's got the biggest stick? Yeah. Who's the one with the biggest clout? <laughs> Let's give them the power. And I'll wait here for them to fix it. And I go, they, they're clubbing you over the head at this point. Uh, and we have to wake up. I'm sorry I went on a, a tirade a little bit, Ryan. The uh, subconscious mind is yours, not shared by anybody else. So it's not a common mind for, for civilization. It's what you downloaded, what you learned, and how you're you know, playing it in your life. Your conscious mind, though, that's the one that is coming from the field uh, where everyone else is involved. And so consciousness is what connects us all. Subconscious is your life experiences. It's used for this lifetime. Uh, and something as the new science revealed to me, which I didn't really know for most of my life, is that uh, we are spiritual entities. I, I was teaching genes, you know, and, and now I start to recognize from the physics that we are spiritual entities uh, and that uh, the body is like a television set. My spirit is the broadcast. When the television you say television is dead and I go yeah television is dead but is the broadcast still there and the answer of course it's still there and I said yes this is the same thing with the human we are not in this body we are receiving a broadcast a field in terms of the science of quantum physics there's a field that's playing through us and I go so if your body dies the field didn't die it's still there and it's like that blew my mind because I said oh my god you can't die you're not even in here and, and then the, the joy about that was you also come back again when another embryo has the same set of what are called self receptors that are reading that field for you each of us has our own set of these self-receptors, these are proteins. No two people have the same set. So each of us is receiving a different energy broadcast. Uh, then uh, let's just turn it back for a second to the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is learned in this lifetime from the experiences we have in this lifetime. But when you pass on and go back to the field, subconscious is gone. And when you come back again, guess what? Fresh subconscious and you start all over again. So the subconscious is used now for this life, the conscious is always here. It's involved whether you are in this body or not in this body, and that is the perpetual person that you really are. The things that you wish for, desire, want in your life, and you have to work hard, sweat over it. I'm putting a lot of effort in, I'm gonna make, yeah. I'm, work, I'm working on it. And I go, why are you working so hard? The answer is beautiful. Because whatever that destination is, you don't have a program to support it. And you're trying to override a habit that doesn't give you what you want by putting more effort into it. And I go, good idea, not good process. Why? 95% of your life is coming from that program. Uh, and 5% from this little conscious mind up here cannot mathematically, if you think about it, the subconscious, a million 
times more powerful programmer than the conscious mind. I mm-hmm. say, and you want to ride override the subconscious? I go, boy, that's a bitch. That's not going to work very well. Uh, and yet there are ways to do it because if it didn't, this is going to be a lousy interview. But <laughs> there are ways to rewrite it. Uh, and the idea about it is if you understand the process, you can rewrite your life and change the outcome. You can change these programs sometimes in 15 minutes or less, okay? But you need to know how to do it, okay? Uh, The relevance about all this is um, uh, uh, the movie The Matrix. Uh, It's science fiction. I go, no, no, no. Movie The Matrix is a documentary. What do you mean? I go, premise, everybody's been programmed. I go, oh, that's a given. (laughs) We are all programmed from last trimester to age seven. Everyone is. But in the movie, they say, well, you can take a red pill and get out of the program. And I want to suggest that most people in our audience right now that we have here today have taken the red pill at one time or another, and their life profoundly changed. I go, Mm -hmm. when was that? One of the best examples is when people fall in love. I go, what do you mean? I go, well, their life is blah, 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 blah. They fall in love. They meet somebody 24 hours later. Oh, life is so beautiful. I'm so in love. I'm so happy. Look, I'm glowing. Look, I got growth hormone in my system. I'm a, I go, 24 hours later after blah, 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 all those years, and 24 hours later, you manifest heaven on earth? I go, how did that happen? And the answer is beautiful. Because the answer is when you fall in love, you stop thinking. You stay present. It's called staying mindful. Mm-hmm. I go, what does that mean? I say, when you're thinking is when the subconscious autopilot kicks in. If you're not thinking, then the conscious creative mind is the one that's manifesting your life. So wow. I go, the moment you fell in love, why would you think? And the reason is this. You've been waiting for this person your whole life. They showed up. You want to think and disconnect from this? I go, no. You want to stay present. You want to be mindful. You want to be there. I go, you stop thinking. I say, what's the result? It's the red pill. The moment you stop thinking is you're not diverting to the subconscious anymore. You are operating from conscious wishes and desires. And so the honeymoon is not an accident. It's a manifestation that says, I'm not playing the program. We have a belief that only physical matter is primary and we've ignored the relevance of what's called energy. And the new physics, quantum physics says, You can't ignore the energy. The energy is what is actually shaping the physical world. So by leaving the energy out of the equation, we've missed the the most important factor, spirituality. Mind is energy. Everything we eat, food is energy. Where we live is energy. So we have to talk about the environment of the invisible nature Hmm. is what's actually shaping our physical experience on this planet. It's a retake, and it says, look, stop focusing on this physical plane. Start recognizing your thoughts and your beliefs and spirituality and energy around us are really reflected in who we are. There's a lot of people that have doubts about the concept of the influence of global meditation. And rightfully so, because we've always been programmed to ignore the invisible realm as not being relevant to our world. But now, with an understanding of quantum physics, and the role that the invisible realm is more powerful in shaping the physical realm than is the physical realm itself. It really adds emphasis to the character that the energy fields in which we live are actually shaping the world that we experience. Is this just a made up idea that I just said? The answer is no. There are scientific studies that have shown how meditation and groups have changed characteristics of cities or towns in regard to violence or love or what was going on in the city. So basically said, while meditators were in the practice of their meditation and bringing peace to the city, it actually changed the people in the city according to the statistics. Point. Did it work? The answer is absolutely. Unfortunately, when the meditators went home, the whole thing stopped. Point is very simple. If we live with that spiritual activism in our heart and use it every day, then this is not just an on and off event. This is a continuous process of shaping the environment and the community in which we live. In the past, if you looked at it, people have perceived themselves as victims of everything around them, victims of circumstances. And then we go, oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, life did not give me 
those wonderful things that other people have. And the simple reality is, no, no, if you have an issue, it's not the outside. This is what we've always, oh, universe, give me something. We now know that our issues are internal. It's our own subconscious beliefs that we've been programmed with of disempowerment. Like when a child is growing up and getting its programs, so think of what things parents say. Oh, you don't deserve this. Who do you think you are? I mean, the parents didn't mean that for your whole life. They just, they were trying to, you know, goad you, you know, needle you to make a change. So they would say these things. 95% of our life comes from those programs. So if you have disempowering beliefs about who you think you are, because you got them from other people, that's how you know who you are. These disempowering beliefs play 95% of the day in an average person's life. So I say, yeah, well, my wishes and desires, oh, I want success, I want great relationships, I want all these wonderful things, I want health. I go, well, that's conscious mind, because conscious mind's creative. But uh, as science reveals, only 5% of the day are we operating from our own personal wishes and desires. 95% of the day we operate from the programs that we got in the first seven years. And if those programs, which psychologists have told us, 70% are negative and disempowering and self-sabotaging, I say, good, ap apply these 95% of the day in your life. And you realize why your life is a struggle. It's not a struggle because the universe is not providing. It's a struggle because your own consciousness is not accepting. And this is where we have to change. And so getting control of your mind, taking charge of your consciousness is a way of overcoming those limitations. There are many different ways to, to take this control back in, in your life. Uh, and one of them is the ability to, uh, like in yoga, for example, to be the master of your mind and not let it run the monkey mind. Let it run. No, I want this. I don't, don't let this other one go. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Joe Dispenza, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you have all of your attention in the present moment, you're conserving a lot of energy to create with. If I'm talking to you and you're thinking about where you're gonna go for lunch and who you're gonna go with,